an important question is, who's the taxpayer? Who's the taxpayer? Uh, when, with the withholding tax, who physically pays the tax? Again, for those of you who recently took 515 or not so recently. The, the company that makes the withholding. Okay, and, uh, okay, so withholding tax, the company which makes the withholding, okay, but what comp, oh, I mean, use an example of, okay, so for example, if you as a U.S. Uh, citizen uh, put uh, your excess funds into a Canadian bank, and if Canada has a withholding tax on the interest that is paid, you're saying that the Canadian bank withholds an amount of interest, uh, I'm sorry, holds from the interest due you an amount of tax and pays that to the Canadian government. So you don't directly pay the Canadian government, but it's paid on your behalf. In a withholding tax situation, you are the taxpayer in that situation. Uh, does anybody uh, ever invest? Uh, yes, go ahead. What do you mean by you? Pardon? You said you are the taxpayer. Oh, I was. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Logan? Yes. Yeah. I was thinking Logan was the taxpayer. Okay. And. Uh, the withholding agent is the bank uh, that is paying him interest. So, for example, if he has, uh, if the bank pays him a hundred of interest, or a, 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 oh, I, let me rephrase that: if the bank owes him one hundred of interest, and if the withholding rate for Canada on interest is, for example, ten percent then 10 would go to the Canadian government and 90 uh, would go to Logan. Uh, also, uh, nominee or agent, uh, for example, foreign securities and street name. Does anybody own, for example, shares in a mutual fund or something that uh, has, uh, that includes within its portfolio some foreign shares? Uh, have you uh, ever seen uh, information about foreign taxes paid or foreign income? Yes, I get a separate little for my six dollar tax credit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This, the, you know, one of the really terrible things is that you know, as we get into this more and more, there's more and more complication. And, you know, how could Congress have created such nonsense? Whether the numbers are, you know, six dollars of interest or six million dollars of interest, you know, for the most part, the rules apply the same. I think there is a, uh, there is some simplification rule for, uh, I think, amounts under like three hundred dollars of foreign taxes or something like that somewhere. But uh, it's, um, uh, it gets pretty scary when you look at small numbers and what you have to go through to get to the right answer. Uh, in any case, uh, the broker, uh, you know, is telling you things, but, uh, you know, the broker has, uh, you know, maybe legally owns the, uh, uh, the securities, the foreign securities, the shares, what have you. But you are considered the taxpayer. You're considered the legal taxpayer. Somebody who is just an agent is, is ignored. It's kind of funny because I have no actual ability in that exchange to have not received it on my behalf or I want to acknowledge it. Which uh, is why tax on wages, tax on interest payments and uh, so on, a lot of those things uh, have withholding because it's easy for governments to apply.
force the person who is making the payment to pay the tax, to make the physical payment. Now, notice it uh, says up there uh, uh, the law and regulations originally allowed a person to be a taxpayer even if some other person earned the income on which the tax was based. Uh, we'll possibly go into this a little more uh, as we uh, go forward, but just a, a, short, uh, a short story uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to make the point that uh, this area is something to be aware of. Uh, uh, before certain rules were changed, finally in 2010, uh, there, uh, the focus of the law and regulations uh, is that focus is specifically on who has the legal liability to pay the tax. So here I was sitting in Hong Kong, uh, spending about 50% of my time helping uh, U.S. citizens who were working in uh, Hong Kong with their, uh, their U.S. tax obligations. And one of my clients was a U.S. citizen married to a Hong Kong Chinese young lady who was a non-resident alien of the United States meaning that she is not a taxpayer. Now, he was really fortunate because she was also income producing. She was working. She had income. Uh, yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, uh, my wife used to, uh, uh, used to work and I thought I was going to be supported in, in my old age in the manner to which I had become accustomed, but she fooled me and retired quite a bit earlier than I was expecting, but that's another story. Anyway, long and short is that at that time in Hong Kong, I don't know about today, but at that time in Hong Kong, uh, the uh, progressive Hong Kong government based on the British model, what have you, uh, the taxpayer, the legal taxpayer was the husband, even though the income was belonged to the wife. Well, gee, uh, back at that time, the before these 2010 changes, uh, we had the situation. Uh, the legal taxpayer is, is the U.S. citizen. Can we <clears throat> take the taxes on the wife's income that were his legal obligation under local law and claim them as foreign tax credits? Uh, my recollection is that we decided back at that time, yes, that was the right answer. Does it make any sense? No. This was back in the late 1970s when we were looking at this. And a little later on, uh, there will probably come to a slide that has a uh, uh, corporate example. But finally, in 2010, uh, they uh, made some new rules that prevent this kind of thing. But still, the important thing to start out with is who has the legal obligation. Yes. Are these the buckets? The new rules that came out in 2010? Uh, no, baskets? no, no. That's the, the bath. Okay. The whole thing is a basket case. But no, the uh, the baskets. That's the foreign tax credit limitation. Okay. And we haven't gotten to that yet. So we will get to that. Um. Okay, uh, now one, uh, one thing that I would like to uh, do a, uh, a small picture about. Uh, so starting out with our picture here, let's say that X uh, has licensed, has licensed uh, technology to some company in country A, call it Y. Now, country A has a withholding tax. Let's say that it's uh, it's ten percent. So that when license payments are made, uh, there's a ten percent 
withholding tax on the, uh, on the royalties. Now, let's say that X up here, uh, and this is something that, that you find periodically, X, uh, uh, X doesn't want the risk, so to speak, of the tax rate in country A going up or down. Uh, as a result, uh, X says to Y, uh, the, you know, today the amount of royalty, let's say, that you would pay is 100. There will be a 10 withholding tax. The net amount that you're going to pay me is 90. Now, I don't care whether the rate goes up in future years or down. I want 90. Always pay me 90. So if the withholding rate, okay, so with uh, right now, we're going to have 90 of cash paid up here. Now, let's say that uh, in a future year, the rate goes to uh, from 10% to 20%. But the payment is still going to be 90. Because by contract, Y is obligated to pay a net amount of royalty, or net of uh, the withholding tax, so that the payment is always 90. Now, if the withholding rate goes up to 20% and the amount of payment is 90, what does that mean uh, happened to the amount of gross royalty? Originally, it was 100. Now it's more than 100. It's more than 100. So without trying to get to exact numbers, let's pretend that uh, it gets to a gross amount of 110 minus, uh, well, it would be a little less, but uh, minus 20 so that uh, we get down to, uh, to 90. Now, again, the business or economic reason why X gets into this net of tax royalty. And you find banks very often doing this kind of thing. Uh, if they're going to earn interest from somebody in another country, the, obli the obligation is to pay a certain net amount after tax, uh, irrespective of whether the tax rate goes up or down. Now. Here, X is a U.S. company, X is going to be claiming a foreign tax credit, where it continues to receive 90, but the tax rate went up to 20 percent. How much is the, uh, how much uh, foreign tax has X paid? Has X, the, do you consider X to continue to be the taxpayer on 10, or does X uh, become a taxpayer for roughly 20. Okay, 20 and why? That's because that's the actual tax payment, but gee, uh, the economic burden of this is on why? Shouldn't that make a difference? You're right, it does not make a difference. Even though you shift the burden, uh, the economic burden, to the other party, if you are still the legal taxpayer. You know, there's all sorts of uh, approaches that you could, you know, you could point at and say, okay, how do you define who's the taxpayer for a particular tax? Could be who makes the physical payment, could be who declares the income in relation to it. Uh, but 
what the rules look at is who has the legal responsibility. Does this necessarily always make sense? You know, should we be giving a tax credit, uh, an extra amount of tax credit for uh, a tax that's economically borne by somebody else? Uh, well, you know, maybe, maybe not. But the way the system works is X gets that higher amount of roughly 20. Clarify. So it's a U.S. tax of 20% on the royalty? No, no. no. The, uh, the, uh, the 20 really? is uh, the tax paid to country A, the withholding tax paid to country A. In other words, when, when Y makes its payment of 90 in this later year, it will pay 20 to the government of country A. So, who's doing the withholding? Why is withholding? Why is withholding? Yeah, why is paying the amount? And I, you know, again, getting back to what uh, is enforceable. If you look at a lot of, in a sense, how tax systems are structured. And again, because a lot of you have looked, you know, have studied 515, the inbound course, why does the U.S. impose withholding taxes on payments to certain payments to foreign persons? Well, because if you, a U.S. citizen, are making the payment to some, you know, foreign person, it's easier to grab you than it is to grab the foreign person. This much easier. So, in a sense, jurisdiction. What you know? What can a country grab easily? That really defines a lot of how these things are. Uh, uh, these tax systems are structured. Effectively connected income. So, a foreign taxpayer has enough in the way of. Uh, business activities, maybe assets, and payments that, again, there's enough within the borders of the United States so that the U.S. can reasonably grab and force that, uh, that person uh, to calculate net income so that it can calculate a tax. Uh, yes? What if I have a double situation? Is it? Oh, I good. Don't. Good question. Uh, not only individuals can have dual citizenship, corporations can have dual citizenship. And this can be done both consciously because there's certain benefits, or it can be done inadvertently and then you get clobbered unexpectedly. So, uh, yeah, if a person has dual citizenship, that can be, uh, that can be a problem in some cases because maybe you have two countries uh, that are each trying to apply worldwide taxation on you as an individual. So you can, so you cannot avoid the double taxation or can you elect? Well, it, it depends on the country, the rules in each country. Maybe you find out that you can apply them, but Gee, do I need simultaneous equations to uh, calculate how much tax there is? Now, in some cases where you're fortunate, there will be an, an applicable tax treaty. And the tax treaty will normally have rules that determine, okay, which country should we consider you a resident of, and then apply that on a consistent basis. So, Tax treaties can be very helpful for us. But uh, yes. And also, remember, I made it very wrong. Remember, should be 125. Oh, then okay, good. Back. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I was. Uh, I know that I cannot do this in my head. 112.5. Yeah. Okay. 
and uh, then 20% gives us uh, 22.5. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you uh, you certainly, certainly have the situation. situation. Uh, I think, uh, I a, think lot a lot of you are, of you are taking, taking the partnership, the partnership course. Uh, a hard partnership, of course, of course for, for many, many countries, countries might, might be a tax Now, Here in the United States, 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 but, but what if, if you, you are, are a part partner, partner with, with, with a citizen, a citizen are part, part partner in a, a part partnership, partnership which uh, pays tax to some other country? And of course, there's not only partnerships, but uh, there are also, for example, LLCs that are treated for tax purposes like partnerships. And they, of course, will commonly be taxpayers for other uh, for other uh, countries. So this is uh, this is a case where the U.S. has you look through, and the partner is considered to be the taxpayer for his share of uh, of uh, foreign taxes paid, and also uh, when we get to that foreign tax credit limitation. Uh, each partner will take his share of the foreign source income from the uh, partnership. So, partnership and uh, also uh, disregarded entity, uh, same, same thing. The owner uh, is considered to be the taxpayer. Okay, just a, you know, in the corporate area, and this is one of the, this is one of the reasons why the law finally got changed in uh, in 2010, uh, what this company, Guardian, had done, notice that this green one is a disregarded entity. And again, we've you know, spoken about the nature of a disregarded entity, which means that all of the income and expenses and uh, whatever tax attributes there are in here, are part of the U.S. consolidation uh, for the uh, Guardian uh, Industries Corp. But what Guardian had done, it put several manufacturing operations into, uh, into uh, local companies, into locally established companies, and it did not treat those as disregarded entities. Rather, they were treated as separate taxpayers under the 7701 entity classification rules. Now, there was, in Luxembourg, there was a fiscal unity. Okay, that's a term that they use locally. Uh, we use the term consolidation, they use fiscal unity as a term, but roughly it's the same thing. And essentially, these four companies, and remember, even though this is a disregarded entity, recognized as a disregarded entity by the U.S., by, for U.S. federal tax purposes, it was a real Luxembourg company for all other purposes. So it was able to have this local group where this disregarded entity was the parent of a local group. Now, under their rules, the common parent was the legal taxpayer, not the subsidiaries. So we had a separation of who had the legal obligation for the tax and which company was earning the relevant income which created the tax. So because of this kind of separation, again, new rules from 2010 which, uh, which uh, uh, eliminated uh, this ability. And again, what was the benefit to them back then? Well, 
there was no current taxation on the profits in the United States, but they could claim the foreign taxes that were paid on those profits, they could claim that on a current basis. Again, they were able to claim on a current basis the Luxembourg taxes paid even though the income was not recognized in the consolidated U.S. return and would not be recognized until some time in the indefinite future when a dividend would be paid. This was under the deferral regime, which was in effect up through 2017, which then, of course, got changed uh, from 2018 with the tax cuts and jobs. In. But again, this point of there being a separation and who has the legal obligation. 